Hello, Scholar Haniel. Can you hear me? I think you are, you are muted. Good morning. Sorry, I'm trying to get a, a good spot. Okay, okay, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah Scholar Habib, welcome. Okay, I think this place is, is better. This is nice. Can you can you see me well? Yeah, I can see you now. Okay. Uh, thanks for, I mean, uh, accepting our invitation to give the talk. Okay. So I think Scholar Abib is also here. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, grant both of you, I mean, an host. So should in case my network just. Okay. Anytime. Okay, okay, no problem. Yeah, Scholar Abib, you are welcome, sir. Can you hear me? Scholar Abib, uh, I think we can't hear you yet. I am, sir. Okay, yeah, great. So I've just made you an post as well. So actually, we are not expecting people are joining us from the YouTube channel. So in fact, their question and answers will be coming from there. So, yeah, I think uh, Scholar Abib, I can manage the uh, that side for you. So, yeah, so that you concentrate with uh, the lecture. Okay, so no, so nobody will be on this um, Zoom. Yeah, except the moderator and you. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they are uh, kindly be aware that they are. <laughs> all hearing you directly from their life. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So, and you know, there is an avenue for the live chat. So if there is any question, so it will be in the past. Okay. Yeah, immediately. No problem. It's fine. So, sorry, which part of the... Uh, United States, are you? Scholar Hanya. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm in, I'm in Louisiana presently. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, how is the atmosphere there? It's fine. It's all right. It's fine. It's um at the moment the weather right at, at the moment it's kind of it's hot because we are in summer right now like it's hot, um, but generally it's just like Nigerian weather going like there's really nothing much there's no much difference but it's hot yeah I know, like it's kind of hot a bit hotter but but to be honest it is it is something we feel right now it's something we can always do it's no problem okay. That's great. So, Scott, I'll be over to you. So, I will be going on in my mission now and I'll be managing uh, the YouTube for you. So, so if there's any question, so I'll be can I share my can I share my screen? Yeah, definitely. So, although I put a dummy there so that people know we are actually live, so what you call. Share your screen now, sir. I prof, did you did you share the screen? Yes, I'm about to do that, sir. Okay. I'm still expecting this because I was in the yes, no? I said. Um, did you? I mean, perhaps send an email reminder. Yes, I sent it. Did you probably send him a reminder? Yes.
Yeah, sure, I can see it. We are also waiting for the second verse to come in places of the scholar Zakaza. I've also missed her. I think she's going to join me soon. Yeah, I think uh, scholar uh, Zainab is here. Yeah, I think it's is is all right. Uh, welcome, scholar Zainab. Can you hear us, please? Hi, I can hear you. Hanya. How are you now? I'm fine. How about you? I'm fine. I do right. I do right. Thanks for accepting the invitation. I would have to miss Paula. How are you doing now? Hi, Amy. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. How are you doing, Ma? How is I'm doing you? good. Fine, fine, fine. Thank you very much. All right. Nice to meet you once again. Grateful to you. Nice to meet you too. We are going to start the session immediately when it is all with me.
Sayın. Ya bu kon Can you hear me right now, sir? Yeah, we yes. can hear you now. I think you can start right. Yeah, we, we can still hear you. Perhaps your hello is called hello. Can you can adjust your microphone. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening from different parts of the world. You are welcome to HISF Hot Sports International Scholar Forum International Scholarship Information Section for the July edition. So I'm Akim Mishola Abib. So I'm going to be the moderator for today's program. And today we are going to consider A to Z on how to secure a fully funded scholarship in the United States of America popularly known as the USA. So we have the outline of the program. So we are having four different sections. The first section will be the brief introduction of the guest speaker. We are having two guest speaker here. Why the second section will be the lecture from the guest speaker one, which is going to last for 40 minutes. And the third section is going to be the lecture from the guest speaker two, which is also going to last for 40 minutes why the last part is going to be the question and answer section, which is going to last for 30 minutes. So let me just read the brief profile of the guest speaker one. Our guest speaker one for today is called uh, Anne Unkadi. Anne Unkadi graduated from the Department of Microbiology of Bafemi Aulawa University, Lefe, the Great Ife. He's a first class student. We are he's able to have a CGP of 4.92 out of five. Anel has a GR score of 321 over 340, a TOEFL score of 105, and also a Duolingo score of 135 over 160, which are the basic standardized tests that are required for admission in the United States of America. Anel is currently a PhD student at Louisiana State University, a subrepet in USA. Apart from his hobby of love for teaching, he is also passionate about helping prospective graduate students in their journey to graduate school. Many people know Anel is the one of the founder of the for, uh, GRE for 2021, 20, 2022, and also 2023. So Anil has won some uh, scholarship, which include the Education USA Fund Program, that is the OFP, the High Scholar In Initiative Scholarship, and also the Louisiana State University SRF Scholarship. He's currently a PhD student at Louisiana State University. That's just the brief profile of our guest speaker one. So our guest speaker two for today is Zaka Zainab. And I just said that what a man can do, a woman can do better. Zainab, Zaka Zainab has a national diploma from the Federal School of Surveying, oil with a distinction. Zaka Zainab later proceeds to the best university of technology in Nigeria, the Federal University of Technology, Akure, great Futurian. We actually graduated as the third best student in our class. Currently, Zainab is a graduate student at Purdue University, West Lafayette, Indiana, USA. Zainab has received some scholarship in the past, which include Purdue University Scholarship, Oregon State University Scholarship, and the great and prestigious Erasmus Mundus Scholarship, the CR7 of scholarship. Those are the brief profile of our guest speaker for today. So this is the overview of our lecture. So we are going to have two sections. Anel is going to handle the first section. Why Zaka Zainab is going to handle the second section. But generally, the overview of our lecture is going to be why the USA funding opportunities 
in the United States of America, what are the application requirements you need to know about the United States of America? How to mail a professor popularly known as the code email uh, code mailing, and also the timeline overview for application, why GRE and TOEFL? GRE is known as the graduate record examination, and TOEFL is known as the test of English as a foreign language. How can you ace this standardized test? How to ace an interview with professors, and also tips to submit a stellar application package and other few news you need to know about graduate school, especially in the United States of America. So we are having these two great scholars here, Anya and Zaka Zainab. They are here to take us through A to Z on how to secure a fully funded scholarship in the United States of America. This webinar is powered by the HISF, Hotspot International Scholarship Forum. So once again, thanks for listening. Um, I came with me, inshallah, Habib. So our guest speaker for today, Anel, is going to start the lecture right now. So, sir, Anel, are you there, sir? Yes, I am. I am. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, hear I can you. hear you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, um, good. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good day, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. I, I, number one, I didn't, did not really, you know, when I got the invitation, I was like, is, is this playing? It's, it's actually an honor that, you know, I was invited to speak here. So, um, but firstly, I would like to say that um, when you were, you can hear me, right? The sound is not disturbing. I'm kind of, I'm in church, so I'm just trying to, you can hear me very well, right? Yes. Okay, okay, fine. So, um, could you make it more audible, sir? Okay, sure, sure, I can, I can. I'll just, I'll just speak, I'll just speak louder. So, um, so the, the, the point is, I was just trying to say that I'm going to be sharing my screen, then we'll be, we'll be starting, um, um, the, 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 the meeting and all. Then, but before I do that, the fall. 2020, fall 2021, 22, 23 groups and all. I was not actually the founder. It was founded by um, um, Don Chris and his friend, um, I think Destiny. So, um, but I'm just kind of managing the groups for a while. I've just been doing that for a while now. So I'm just going to be sharing my screen to, um, because I prepared some slides. Yeah, um, desktop, share. You can, you can see my screen now, right? Yes. Okay, okay, so um, this, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to be speaking and um, just like you've, we've all seen, if you have any questions, um, we can just drop them in the YouTube channel or something. So, um, but yeah. So I'm just a little 10, sorry. So the A to Z of um, having a fully, a fully funded um, scholarship um, in the US. So what I'll be talking about today primarily would be um, why GRE and TOEFL, um, how to ace this standardized test, that is GRE and TOEFL, um, how to ace interviews with professors and um, um, the tips you can get to submit a stellar application package and then, and then others. So um, these are the um, 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 things I'll be speaking about today. So first of all, I'll talk about why do you need GRE and TOEFL? Like, um, I don't know how vast we are here or um, how much we are informed or GRE is the graduate record exam. I usually say it's just like an aptitude test. It's just simply an aptitude test, just to test your attitude, that's all. Um, the TOEFL is just an English proficiency test. Can you speak English? Can you, can, you, can you understand English? Can you communicate in English with someone? That is what the TOEFL test, and that's all. So that's basically what the TOEFL test. So why do you need GRE and TOEFL, especially for your application to, to the US? The first thing is probabilities. I tell people this thing about probabilities. As much as um, probabilities is a major topic in mathematics, um, probabilities is something that... Uh, um, I do not actually play with because this is the point. So you, let's just 
create a scenario in our head. There are, let's say there are 10 schools in the US, A to J. Oh, yeah, I think J is the 10th one, okay, I don't know, A to J. So there are 10 schools in the US. Five schools require standardized tests. Standardized tests are your GRB and your TOEFL. Five schools require standardized tests. Um, five schools do not require standardized tests. Now, without GRE and TOEFL, you stand a chance of applying to only five schools. That is the schools that do not require the standardized test. But with your GRE and TOEFL, you stand a chance to apply to 10 schools. So I'm not saying you're going to apply to all the schools in the US, like just get the picture I'm trying to paint. Like I'm trying to say that it increases your chances because what if what you want to do is in some of those five schools that need GRE and TOEFL. She understands. So those things increase your chances of getting admitted, especially because you are not coming with money. Most of us are looking for fully funded offers. And we both know that the US funds really well. Like I'm not paying anything here. I, I'm not paying Shinbai. I'm not paying anything. I'm being funded fully. And that's how most um, PhD programs and some master's programs are. So you, you would be, you would be, you will be funded. It's just like them taking you from, taking an international student, giving you a degree and paying you to get that degree. So they're paying you to school for yourself. Of course, you are contributing immensely by doing research, by doing teaching, by doing something for the school, fine. But you are going to get a degree and it's looking like you're doing it. They're paying you for it. Like they're picking you up, training you and paying you for that training. So those are the things that we have to always remember, probability. So um, you, 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 Okay, okay, I'm to raise my voice. Can you, is it, is it better now? Yeah, yeah, it's better now. It's better now, right? Sorry, yeah, it's because maintain, I'm in church. Maintain it like that, <laughs> thank you. Okay, okay, I, did, I didn't want to like miss church. That's why I just, I'll do it in, okay. So like, I'll just maintain it this way. So, um, so what I'm saying is um, the probabilities of you getting funded, um, um, like you, the probability of you getting in, it's, 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 it increases your probabilities because it increases your range, the number of schools you can apply to when you write these exams. Then the second reason why I actually advise people to write these exams is um, um, to boost yourself. Like most of us, um, we have, not everybody has a, in quotes, a stellar undergraduate background. Some of us have, do not have first class um, 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 results. Some of us do not have two one results. Some of us have, two, some of us have two, 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 two results. Like I know people with two, two results that are in the US, fully funded PhDs. Like I'm not telling you that I heard, like, like I saw their admission package, like I saw their admission, like everything. So it's not like um, maybe I was stoned or something. No, that's not it. I, 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 I I know, I know, I know, I know that these things work, but the people I know that wrote these exams, it, it helps you, it gives numbers to your application. It's just like saying, oh, let's say your GPA is 3.27 over 5.0, and then you convert it using a West online calculator, and you have a 2.93 over 4.0, let's just say, and then you have a GRE score of, let me say, 330 or 338 over 400. Oh, sorry, over 338, I'm talking about jump, sorry. Um, 338 over, over, over 340. And you have a TOEFL score that is fairly nice. So maybe say one, 115 over 120 or something. Now, somebody would have to take a, a, a look twice on your application, even though your GPA looks, in quotes, low. She understand. And majorly, these people are not, they know that sometimes we, we, we may not be, students may not be all serious when we are younger, when we are in undergrad, because of course we are just building our lives, just starting. So it, that excuse is, is always valid because I mean, it, it's possible that you had some financial challenges when you were in school, you had to um, maybe um, sell some, I, mean, I had many financial challenges when I was in school, really, really I had enough. So, but, but the thing is, the thing is, or it's possible that within your class, so if you enter um, geology department in OA, you would know that, you finishing with 4.1 over 5.0 itself is like you are top notch. That one is you understand. So, as much as well as as much as they are looking at your CGP, they're also looking at every other aspect of your application. Like the question is, the question is what um what um what can you add to your application? How can you boost yourself? How can you add numbers to your application? And GRE and TOEFL, these things are they are good ways to actually add numbers to your to, to your application because 
numbers do not actually lie. These people believe numbers. She understand as much as you want to have an interview with them, you want to have an interview with them. Of course, I know you speak English, but how can I be sure? How can I prove that to my graduate coordinator that, oh, the person I want to admit, I want, I'm a professor, I want to admit someone, I want to bring in someone into the program. How would I tell the person that, oh, this person speaks English? Oh, the GPA is kind of low, but then how, how, how would I prove that, oh, this person can actually survive? Of course, people would argue that the GRE, the TOEFL, they are not, um, they are not the real test of true knowledge. Fine, but why don't you write it? So the point is, the point is, anything, when I was applying, anything that would increase my chances of getting in, I will do it. She understand? I will do it. I actually even wanted to write GRE subject tests. That is in, in, in one biology thing. I wanted to, like, I mean, anything that would just increase my chances because application cycles run after, year after year. So if you miss this application cycle, you have to wait for the next. She understand? So, I mean... If it's if you can do it, please, I advise you to do it. It would boost it would boost your application to help you with numbers. Then the third one is funding. Some schools will tell you that they're waving GRE, but I, it's not like I've been experiencing this for 10 years. But with the little experience I've 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 had, I will tell you that these people use these exams for funding purposes in the sense that um, let me say I want to give you a teaching assistantship now. You will not you will not tell the graduate coordinator. That wants to give you a teaching assistantship or the chairman of the department you will not tell them that you can speak english and they would give you a teaching assistantship because you told them that you can speak english like how do i know you can speak english she understand how do i know you would even notice that in most of these schools nigeria is not amongst the 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 the, the list of schools that have english as their official language of course some of you some people always want to use um a letter from the school that states that Oh, this is um, Haniel Nkadi. He graduated from the Department of Microbiology or Bafumiolo University. During his four-year program at the university, as later at the University of Ife, he was taught in the primary language of instruction was English language. And you want to use that letter for um, as to secure a waiver for your English or English proficiency test, like IELTS and TOEFL. Those are English proficiency tests. Most time, most of those letters even have grammatical errors in them. Like, how does it make sense? Like, what you want to use to get a waiver for an English proficiency test has a grammatical error in it. And you think that makes sense. You think that sounds right. I think that gives you the best opportunity. You think that. So what I'm saying is some of these schools, they may not tell you that they're using this test for assistantship. And most times, they will tell you to go write this test. You see, you, you get admission and they will tell you that, um, okay, that um, you, you, you are sending, they are sending in your application for a teaching assistantship now, and they are like, you should submit your official TOEFL scores, and you are not like, I did not write TOEFL. I mean, to be honest with you, that slot you are looking for, there are like more than ten people looking for that same slot, and people on the wait list. Do you understand? I know people that have gotten admitted and they took back the application, and you know, I, they would have given it to somebody else because they can't take back admission and keep it to themselves. Of course, do you understand? So, um. As much as you want to go to school in the US, we would not be able to go if there's no money. So whatever would give you the chances of getting funded, please do it. And to be honest with you, GRE and TOEFL would increase your chances of getting admission as well as increase your chances of getting funded. Some professors ask for GRE score. Some professors have personal GRE score and TOEFL requirement, as in personal. Some people want the, like, students that would wow them some people want those kind of students like it's just increase your chance it's most times when i'm telling people about this jerry and tofu it always sounds like the ets ets is the body in charge of the exams um it looks like ets is paying me but i don't know anybody in ets nobody's paying me anything of course you understand if they are i, I might shout more than this but then i always see people looking for waivers here and there looking for waivers here and there and it doesn't make any sense because you're just shooting yourself in the leg. She understand anything that you know will tighten your application. Please try and do it. So the next thing I'll be talking about is um, how you can ace the standardized test. So I'm going to start with the GRE. So um, for the GRE, um, I think you should study the right things at the right pace. You should study the right things at the right pace. Yeah, you should study the right things at the right pace. So um, I would say that. Uh, for the GRE, there are three aspects of the GRE. Quantitative, it's, it's I'm just going to be giving a summary. It's not, it's not um, an in-depth lecture because, you know, talking about the GRE in, de in, in depth would, would take a long time. So I'm just going to give a summary of how you, how I think you can ace exams. I've, I've been in 
I've been in GRE group chats for, for a while now. I wrote GRP too. So I'm not telling you from somebody's experience. I'm telling you from my experience that these are things that helped me. So I studied microbiology. I do not have the best quantitative background, even though I like math. I like math because I believe math and physics. Um, I know people think it's the true science, but it's very tempting for me to join them because maths and physics is awesome. I'm just saying, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a virologist. So, but then I know maths and physics is awesome. So, um, yeah, so if you, if you are a mathematician or a physicist, you should always be proud of yourself. So um, what I'm saying is for the GRE, I think these books helped me. So um, ETS books, they are ETS official guide. ETS is the body that's in charge of the exam. So it only makes sense that you, that, you, that, you, that you use their books at least to start. They're using their books to know how the exam looks like, what kind of questions to expect, what they will not ask. ETS will tell you what they will not ask. It's just like you going for GRE and reading calculus. Calculus will never come out. You never see dy, dx, you never see ETB, you will never see those things. So it, is, it just makes sense that you, you know what they would set. She understand, and there are rules they will give you specifically in quants. They will give you specific rules. They will say something like all images are drawn on the same plane. I can't remember, I don't think, but they will say something like all images are drawn on the same plane, something like that. So read ETS books to have an experience of what the exam would look like, what to expect. Those are ETS books. Then Manhattan Six books. Manhattan Six books, there are six books. That's why they call Manhattan Six books, of course. So um, um, this Manhattan Six books, um, um, include um, uh, Manhattan algebra, Manhattan um, number properties, Manhattan um, fraction decimals and percentages, Manhattan data interpretation, Manhattan geometry, and um, Manhattan something. Yeah, they are, they are six. So you, quantitative comparison, yeah, Manhattan quantitative comparison. So I advise people to read these books. Then um, um, five pound, that's five LB. So five pound, five pound is also a Manhattan book, but it's, Five pound is like a, a pack of questions that you do just to practice. Do you understand? So that's five pound. So I encourage people to do it at the end of, you know, you are, you are done reading. The two books I encourage you, the three books I encourage people to do when they are done reading is five pound, Nova GRE Bible and KMF 240 questions. Nova GRE Bible is not good to go in when you are starting. You would, the point is Nova GRE Bible will carry you go where you don't know if you do not know much about GRE or much about quant, you will be taken to like violent places. So it's just good that you, you have a good background before you start with about GRE. Bible. I encourage cliff notes for those that are, I encourage cliff notes for those that are in, in quotes, like have a poor quant background. I read cliff notes. In fact, I finished cliff notes. I finished cliff notes. I read algebra for dummies. I read them. Um, um, geometry for dummies, I read um, um, statistics for dummies, I read probability for dummies, I read all these books. In fact, I read Manhattan six books twice, like twice. She understand? And I read Nova Jai Bible twice. It's just like I was jobless. There was no job. There was nothing I was doing. So I was just, you know, using it to have fun and all. So these are the books I encourage for quantitative. And sincerely, I know that HISF has a drive for all these books. Then, um, then the, um, for verbal, ETS books also, then Kaplan. Please use the latest edition for Kaplan. GRE Big Book is an old book. This book is an old book. What, what happened is, I don't like, I don't like verbal. I'm, I'm one of, many guys don't like verbal. Many guys like one, many ladies like verbal. But please forget, do not be biased in your reading. Um, um, I don't like verbal, man, don't like. But because English, they're always too much. But, but the point is, the point is, GRE Big Book helped me to understand what what I was looking for like in a passage. So, so GRE book book would help. KMF is like a compilation of text completion questions. KMF TC is text completion and KMF SA is sentence equivalent and KMF RC is reading comprehension. So these books would help you. Then analytical writing, ETS books, just read ETS books. Analytical writing is just you writing. It's not, it's not much of a big deal, but do not downplay it, you understand? Do not downplay it why I downplayed it because I, I, I downplayed it because I normally write, normally like I write poems and all. I just, I, I just, you know, downplayed it and all. My score was, was not what I expected, but I mean, I shall pass. But do not, don't downplay, don't follow me. Don't follow me. You can follow me on quant and baba, but don't follow me on analytical writing. Just read very well, read ETS books. Now I'll be going next to TOEFL. So TOEFL is the same thing. Study the writing at the right pace. And why I'm saying people should study the right things at the right pace is the fact that people always want to do what their friend is doing. Oh, my friend is reading so, so, and so. I want to read so, so, and so. No, it's not like that. It's, it's 
just you. You should do your thing. You understand? You know how best to read. So, like, I, like I was talking to a lady one time, and she was telling me she always reads at night. And then I remember that this lady has insomnia. So, why would I be struggling with myself to stay all night and drink coffee and keep myself? Somebody has insomnia and it is helping her, you know, enjoy the something normal, normal. Do you understand? So, please read at the pace that you would like. Some people break their reading. You read two hours, sleep. Read two hours again, sleep. Or read four. Like I break my reading. I read four then sleep, then read four. My, my kid brother can read up to 12 in a stretch on one seat and just be drinking water, be drinking something. That, that's, people are different. So do your thing, read at the right pace, but then read fast because um, most schools in the US access applications um, December 1, as that December 1 is their deadline for fall 2023. So you have to be ready with those exams before then so they can submit those exams and all. That is just my, um, my, um, my advice. So, um, yeah, so for um, ETS, for um, TOEFL rather, I used ETS official guide and I used one Cambridge desktop app that simulates the exam. It's, it's just like a practice test. So I just used that and I passed, I did well. Then um, it, TOEFL just has to do with four aspects, reading, listening, speaking, and writing. Out of, out of all the, the four of them, I think the, the craziest since I've heard is about the speaking because you go, you go the year things for whole. You understand? Speaking is, you know, it's very dicey. Do you understand? But you have, you can do it. I actually did it. I, I did well. So I just think anybody can actually do it. So, so how do you ace your interviews with professors? Oh, thank God. Um, yeah. So how do you ace your interviews with professors? Yeah. So, um, so the first thing I would like to say is, this is the point. Let, let me just let's let's take it back back a little. So. This is me, I want to apply to a school. So this is what I tell people to do when they want to apply to a school. Number one thing is write your exams. After you've written your exams, number two thing is, um, okay, this is your exam, you've written it, that's off the grid. And then number two thing is you send mails to graduate coordinators. I want to apply to Stanford. I want to apply to, to, to University of Utah. Now I will send mails to the graduate coordinator of Stanford University and the graduate coordinator of University of Utah. I'll ask them, how are you doing? Is there funding available for this program? Blah, 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 blah. More so, am I to contact the professor before applying or it is not required? She understand. There are, there are many um, ways or many reasons why you should contact the professor. Number one is what I just said. If you ask the graduate coordinator and the graduate coordinator is like, you need to contact the professor before applying or the graduate coordinator says it is optional. Please, whenever they tell you it is optional, please contact professor to understand because um, you don't want to reduce your chances. But when they tell you do not, then do not. She understand. The other reason why you should contact the professor um, is through LinkedIn. They share, they share their posts on LinkedIn saying they need students, even on Twitter. I most times repost those things and share, share them, you understand? They, they are looking for students too. I contacted a professor like that in Oakland University and then she interviewed me. She understand. She, she interviewed me and she was like, I should apply for a PhD program. And she gave me the offer. Although I, I'm not there right now because I have another, it, it seemingly, you know, another offer here. But then um, that's the best thing. So for, for you to ace your interviews, I, I feel you should be human first. I don't think people are convenient working with robots. I am not, to be honest. That's why I even don't feel nice always. Like when I hear something like scholar hand nail, it's, I, I'm, I'm not, it's not, it does not give me the best and um, how I put it. I just feel it's too serious. Let me just be honest. And me, I'm not too serious like that. Like, not like I'm not a serious person, but I mean, to me, I, you get my point. So I'm just trying to say that be human, like talk, smile. Like, talk, smile. Let's not be like you are facing a Nigerian interviewer in quotes. I'm not trying to do anything here, but you know how they will tell you there's a particular way you should sit down, you can say where you should do your, your chair, you, your side, this thing will show. If you cross leg, that's disrespect. No, that's not what these people are looking for. They're looking for human beings. But that does not also mean that you not sit down and or something. No, you, you, can, you can comport yourself well. You can appear human and you can also appear smart without appearing like a robot, honestly. So be human in your, in your gestures and how you talk. And number two, remember that you have words. Always remember that as much as you want them to um, um, give you a fully funded offer, they also need you to work in their lab. You're not going there to do nothing. She understand? It's, it's, it's something for them that you're coming, to, they're to come, you're coming here to work. Like I was in the lab yesterday. Yesterday was Saturday. I went to the lab. I got to the lab by 10 a.m. I left the lab by 7 p.m. This is, church. I'm in church right now. From church, I'm going, I have a driving lesson, but after my driving lesson, I'm going to the lab and I am very sure I'm not leaving the lab till 
and before 8, 8 p.m. this evening. I am not because I have experiments to run and I still have to start the experiment very early tomorrow morning around 8 a.m. So the point is you're coming here to work also. Always remember that you have what? Always remember that you're smart. I know your school, your undergrad may not have given you the best experience or something, but please remember that you are smart. Remember that you have what? So don't talk like, you know, you don't have what? Because most people, they will sense it. Me, I will sense it when somebody's trying to sound pitiable. I would actually sense it. And it, it does not give me the best impression about someone. That is me personally. And I think people would have that in mind too. So remember they have what and be human. It is more about how you can be trained. I hear, I see people's SOPs. I have been reviewing SOPs for a very long time. I have, I have been doing that. Even, while, even now I have close to five in my email. I've not had time to check them. I've been reviewing SOPs. I've been reviewing CVs and all. Some people want to always say stuff like, I have the required skill. Which skill set do you have? Is it about... It's not about uh, using mouth to suck by pets. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not the skill sets I'm talking about or something. I know you might have skill sets. Of course, you might be you might be gifted in bioinformatics. Or it might be this, you might be that, you might be this, you might be that. Try and be humble, like bring down yourself. I'm not trying to bring down yourself to an extent that you feel trampled on. No, that's what I'm saying. I'm trying to say that focus more on how you can be trained in that person's lab. That is what the person wants to know. The person wants to advance your career as well, as much as you are trying to advance his. Because any paper you produce from that laboratory you're going to join or from that um, professor you're going to join his lab, any paper would be ascribed to the professor and not to, like, it's not your paper. It's anything I produce here is not Nigeria's. It is for the US. So the US is the one training me in quotes. She understand that one's training me. So um, what, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, um, it's more about you. How can you be trained? How can this professor train you? How can you just be trained? That's the point. So um, um, always focus on that. Of course, you can bring your skill sets to the table. You know, say, oh, I, I, I have a programming background. I know Python programming. I know C++. I know C++. I don't know how, how many you know or something. But or um, um, I am skilled in data analysis. I am skilled in SPSS. I am skilled in startup, blah, blah, blah. But then always remember that you talk more of um, how you can be trained. You understand that? I've seen that you, you your lab focuses on this, on this. That's what I'm interested in. I believe you can train me, stuff, stuff like that. Focus on that more, but don't neglect yourself though. The next one, listen before you speak. Don't don't rush. Do you get? Don't be running. She understand. Like listen before you speak. Listen to their questions very well, and speak calmly. She understand. Speak calmly because speak calmly because you have an accent. No matter how you want to speak the English, you have an accent. She understand. It's it's very like me now. They hear me very well. She understand, but. I can't speak at this pace to them. I have to slow down, even to my supervisor. I have to slow down, but I can speak with this accent. This is my. This is me. I, I'm not. Not the. Uh, you know. I, no, I'm not. I don't know. I'm not the. You understand? But they would hear you if you calm down and speak. She understand. They're not used to your accent, so you have to calm down and speak to them small, small. Because most of them do not want to hurt your feelings. So honestly, they will not tell you they did not hear you when you when when they did not hear you. You can say something for ten minutes and they'll be like, oh, oh wow. That's, that's really cool. They know you're anything. They know you're actually right. But, but you have to slow down and allow them listen. And you'll be looking at them. When somebody is listening to you, you would know. You would actually know. That's why you have to be smart in the interview. It's a human relationship. You should know. If You should just know. Then um, um, know, your, know the research background of your lab. I'm not saying you should read all the papers the lab has to offer. No. Know the basics of the lab. What is this lab doing? What is this, the techniques they mostly use? You can't tell. You, you are going to interview with a professor that's in an immune, immunology immunology lab. You want to interview with a professor in an immunology lab and you don't know he's doing Western blood. You don't know he's doing a, maybe Southern blood or you don't know like the basic things that they do in the lab. You should know, you should, you should have a core idea of the techniques that they use in the lab. Like you should just have, you know, they do DNA stuff and that is where your questions will actually come from most times. Yeah. Then also remember that you may not know everything. They know your background. They know where we are from. They know, you know, that it's not as developed as it is over here. And they know. So you may not know everything. So, and it's not, it's just bad that you maybe you now start lying. Actually, I've, I've seen people when, like, you are asked something about your undergraduate study and you are talking and talking and talking and talking and then you want to go and lie inside. These people have our experience. So they can, they, they may be able to get you lying. She understands. So don't take those. In fact, honesty is, is key. I'm very honest with many things. She understands. Then have smart questions too. Um, have smart questions. But remember, you will not have smart questions if you do not know well about the person you're interviewing with. I remember I asked one man one question one time. The man was, the man just liked me. 
Do you understand? He was even the one pushing, kind of pushing for me to get admitted into Tulane University. Like he was kind of pushing. He's, he's like a very old professor. He was the oldest in the school. Do you understand? And then let's not say the oldest in the school, like the oldest I, I saw there. So, um, so I noticed that he was in, I noticed that he was in, I think he started with psychology, I believe philosophy in his undergrad. Then graduate school, he went to physiology and now he was a professor of physiology and stuff. So the question I asked him was, the question I asked him was, how did you make that transition from, um, um, to physiology? How do you make that transition and all? Because I could see your background. And he saw it as an avenue to, me and this man gist, the man gist. The man was not talking about his undergrad, how they were cope, um, struggling to cope with the exam, how he was failing the exam. He almost failed out, blah, blah, blah. Like we had a good time. The interview changed to gist. I'm honest with you. So ask smart questions. Don't ask personal questions like, oh, I, I, I heard you are broken up with your husband. I mean, right? I'm, I know that's extreme, but I mean, you know what I'm talking? Smart questions. Like smart questions in the sense that like, Ask questions that you do not know. Ask questions that you cannot see on Google. So ask those questions. I think I have like five minutes left, I think. Um, okay, then have a good LinkedIn profile. I put an asterisk there because it's not always needed, but I just want to point it out. Sometimes these professors may not, when they when you send an email to them, they may just check your name and they say, let, let, let me go and check out this human being on LinkedIn. Some of them are LinkedIn, you know, um, LinkedIn, how I put it. They love LinkedIn. She understands. So they may want to check your profile on LinkedIn. And when they check your profile on LinkedIn, I'll see one funny something. She understands. So you have to have a, a good LinkedIn profile. You get me? So you have to have a good LinkedIn profile. It helps. It actually helps you. Do you understand? It, it, it helps you a lot. Then um, you have to speak clearly with a good pace. I think I covered this when I was talking one time. So speak clearly but with a good pace. So I'm done with this part. So this is the last part. So something is stellar application. So um, try to start early. Start early. Start compiling your stuff early. Write your CV now. Do you understand? Get ready for your exams. Like start early. Because all those rush, 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 start talking to your recommenders. They, they wish they happy new month now. She understands. Well, they want you to go, buy wine for them. Buy wine. I mean, there is, ah, ah, buy wine. Don't, don't, don't bring this thing. If they want wine, buy wine. This thing is, there's no, you get, it's normal. Just buy wine for them. Some of them, you understand? So just start early. Start with your CV, your, um, um, Okay, okay, so I'll, I'll respond to that to those later. So um, um, start early, start with your CV, your transcript. Some of you don't have your transcript. I understand ASU is on strike and all, but please, even if you can get the unofficial, she understand. If it's, if it's too bad, take a, a PDF, like save a PDF of your portal page, of your result page from part one to part four, or from part, like 400 level to 500 level or 400 level, like save a PDF version of it. That can, that can serve as official transcript. Just print it. Give it, take it to your, maybe your head of department to sign it for you. That's something. Instead of you just saying that, oh, as to do strike, uh, there's, you know, there's no official, tra there's no transcript. I mean, if you want something, you will go for it. You understand? You, if you want something, you actually go for it. So you get me? So that's just it. Then read instructions. When you have something in your applications, read instructions. If they say SOP maximum 500 words, don't go and write 501. Some people are very, 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 they look at instructions. Very, me, I'm like that. Let me be very honest with you. If if, if I dare admission come, I, I'm not being wicked, honestly, because because I mean, if I don't admission committee, they say 500 words, and I say 501. The only reason I would read, look at that SOP is maybe I don't have any other students. But if I have 200 students for slot, that is three people that will enter that slot out of 200. I mean, I can't be stressing myself over somebody that does not obey with small instruction. Now. I mean, no reason. Now. Let's 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 be let's let's be guided. You understand? So that's how it is. Then um, do not reply rely too much on app fee waivers. Yeah, people get up. I got app fee waivers. I got up to twenty one app fee waivers. So, uh, up to twenty five, but I didn't use all of them. There was a school that we actually paid for. Although I didn't pay for most of my school applications. It was Education USA that paid for most of my school applications and all. So um um. So please do not rely too much on appeal waivers because this is the point about appeal waivers. I'll, I'll be done soon. I'm very sorry. I'll be done soon. So, so um, um, appeal waivers. This is the point. Let's let's paint a picture. So, there's a program, electrical engineering PhD program, University of um, University of Benin. Let's just say University of Benin is a school in the US. Calm down. So, University of Benin. So, University of Benin, electrical engineering. So, um. We have three positions to be filled for a PhD, three positions. 200, um, normally 100 people will apply with an application fee of 
50 50 dollar per, per, per person now when they remove the application fee you would agree with me that 100 people will not apply let's just multiply number by two to be on the safe side let's just say times two 200 people will apply before the probability of you getting it was three over 100 she understand like probably of someone getting it was three over 100 at least people will get it out of 100 right but now the probability is now reduced to three over 200 so always remember that with app fever comes that constraint of getting in, comes that reduction in probability and you have to consider that so use your app fever fine but do not rely on it spend money to get what you are looking for also then um ask for help when you need help you understand ask for help if you need someone to look at your sop if you need someone to look at something for you please ask i know hisf does many of these things so but people don't just ask you understand and number two please Garbage that mindset of I just want to chat, but like I don't like that mindset because you don't do well with that mindset. Don't garbage it because you have to come here to study. I mean, you, honestly, graduate school is not easy. Let me just be honest with you guys. Graduate school is not easy. So if you have that jackpot mindset, you may you might not do well, even when you get here. So please always oh, and also back to what I was saying, always ask for help if you do need help. Then um, tell your referees to use official email addresses. I said this on a group chat some days ago, like. Do let them not use Gmail or Yahoo Mail because most schools want to verify that it is actually your referee that sends this send this stuff. Mm -hmm. See this that I can always create an email and name it uh, Agunjo B Azumbodo um, at gmail.com and say that I'm a professor. No, they have to verify. If it's not something like at uniben.edu.eg and um, edu.ng, that would, that's a verified email and official. Please let them have official email address. It is the best, I'm honest with you. Then um, talk to graduate coordinators. If you face any problems while you're applying, that is why they are paying the graduate coordinator. You don't need to ask different people, like you ask the world before you get an answer. Talk to your graduate coordinator. The graduate coordinator would, would let you know what's going on. Then um, talk to professors. Like, like, yeah, that's what I said it earlier on. Email graduate coordinators. Then if they tell you to email professors, please email professors, talk to them. You know, have a good conversation with them. Like, you know, you you go do right like it's not these things these things are not hard but they are not easy you have to be really interested and you have to give it your all she you understand so pray too i also I always like pray because i just I, like pray because i mean sometimes it's not your fault your application will, they will just kind of go away you, where you don't know but you you have to also pray and you know there's a god factor in everything i do sha i don't know about you but i just believe that you have to also pray sorry i'm rushing i'm I'm trying to speed up because of time. So I'm um, also stay strong. I applied to 21 schools in the US. I got rejected by 18. 18. She so understand. And um, it wasn't easy. I mean, I, it, it, to get to a time, you'll be like, she might drink bleach. I might not drink bleach. I be might use rope. You get so honestly, but you have to stay strong. It's not easy. Some people apply to three schools and get accepted by two. And you'll be like, Lord, why me? She so understand. But but then everybody has their hustle. Everybody has their hustle, honestly. So it's, and it also depends on your research interest. I was going into cancer biology. I love, I love cancer. Not like I love cancer, but you understand what I mean? But, you know, it's, it's a very competitive field. You understand? So please try and stay strong. You know, easy. so I think with that, I'm done. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Yep. Uh, thank you very much, Anil. Thanks for the great insight about the lecture. So we are very grateful for this opportunity. But before we take the second section, in which is going to be handled by Zaka Zainem, someone has a question that, can you just give us the list of schools that require GRE and TOEFL, and they do not require you to message a professor because professor are not replying to their food mail? Um, I think if a professor is not replying your code mail, um, I don't know why because every professor has sent a mail to, they replied me. I'm not trying to tell you that they replied me because I'm handheld. No, it's because I sent reminders. I sent up to two reminders to every professor I, me I messaged. So I messaged you on a Monday, you know, reply me. That's meant. So I will just send you a reminder on Wednesday and another reminder on Friday. So with that, I think all the professors I sent messages to, they always, at least, even though they will try to tell you that they don't have space. That's the maximum, that's the worst thing they can tell you. They don't have a position for you. She understand. Then about a list of schools, um, personally, I would not, I, I do not have a list of schools that have GRE and TOEFL that also gives funding. And I think if I had, I would not send it out. Why? Because I am usually of the opinion that you can do these things yourself. 
Do you understand? I'm, I'm of that opinion because there are many schools that are not popular. If I send a list of schools, I don't have a list of schools though, but if I send a list of schools, the competition for those list of schools would be, would be high. There are schools that nobody has entered. Like, no, no people know they enter around. People are not trying to go there. Do you understand? And that's where you, you, you might have your best chance. That's where they might pick you quickly. But you can only get that if you search yourself. There are websites for it. I can, I'm going to drop it on the YouTube channel now, 4icu.org, then um, usnews.com usnews.com so when you go to those websites you will see schools you will see schools check because the, the point is it's not about schools requiring GRE and TOEFL and then giving funding no department A may require GRE and TOEFL and no funding is there department B in that same school require GRE and TOEFL and funding is short like in my department you cannot be admitted without funding they only admit the number of people they can fund so if they're admitting six students, six of them will be, uh, will be funded for the whole entire, the, uh, the entire program, like the whole five years, she understand. So, um, so the point is you have to do this search yourself. It helps you, she understand. It actually helps you go on. So that's it. I think I've answered the question. Okay. Another question is, the person has asked, can someone use IELTS to substitute uh, TOEFL? Instead of using TOEFL, can someone use IELTS? Yes, you can. You can. IELTS is, is, is recognized in the US as an English proficiency test. But it's just like, um, when, you know how Nigeria recognizes why can neko. But if they ask you, um, what do you score? Now, for why they always talk, why is like the first point of contact it comes, that comes to people's head. Why she understand. But neko is like secondary. I didn't even write why I can neko, I write. But you know, did that time. So, so, neko, I write. So, when people ask me, what's your YX score? I'll be like, no, I have NECO. I don't have YX. Just the same thing. What's your TOEFL score? I have IELTS. I don't have NECO. Well, TOEFL. She understand. So, but IELTS is, is, the, is the TOEFL of the UK. And I think it's also the TOEFL of, the, of Canada. So, IELTS is more recognized in the UK as first, first thought. You understand? Not necessarily first choice. First thought. She understand. But in the US, TOEFL is first thought. YX, um, God forbid. Um, IELTS is, is second thought. She understand. So, that's it. It, can, it is perfect for US. It's no problem. All right. Thank you very much, Daniel. So yeah. we are going to have the second speaker right now. Yeah, um, um, sorry, um, Abib, is it, you know I'm in church, is it possible I, I leave now if there are no other questions for me? Like, yeah, uh, sorry, it's called, I think uh, there is separate uh, hours for question and answer. Okay, is it possible I get a message on WhatsApp or something so I can just come back to answer questions during that time or something? Yes, yes. I'm, I can, I, I, I'm not sure if I can, but I think um, Zena can handle, can handle um, now, now my mom, see? No stress. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Anil. Okay, no problem. no problem. All right, Anil. Yeah. Yo, nice seeing you. Yeah, bye. Uh, bye. Yeah, bye. Bye. Okay. So, scholars, I can't say anybody here, ma. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, we can hear. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. I think I, 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 maybe is freezing. You can just share your screen straight now. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, sir? Um, can you, can you like allow me to share my screen? Okay, yeah, let me just. Oh, you can share your screen. Host straight away. Yes. Um, host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, sorry, just a minute. Yeah, sure, take your time. Can you try that now? Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, um, Abib, for the introduction. So um, I'll be talking about um, the outline given to me why the US, I'll be talking about funding opportunities in the US, I'll be talking about application requirements, and I'll be talking about how to mail professors and timeline 
overview for application. So um, the first one, why the US? And I'll be talking from the perspective of an international student. Um, sorry, firstly, um, funding opportunities that. like you see. Yeah, sorry, please, could you yes. use like a full screen, full screen mode? Full screen mode, sorry. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's okay now, it's okay now. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, sure. So like I was saying, um, I'll be starting with why the US and I'll be taking from the perspective of an international student. Um, first of all, there is funding opportunities in the US. Like, if you, like, you just have to know that there's funding opportunities. The only thing is if you don't know how to find it, like there's a lot of funding opportunities in the US. Another option is that um, there's exhaustive school options. There's a lot of schools for you to choose from, perspective of your background or your interest. And also, this also depends if you know how to like search for schools, because sometimes people don't know like how to find the course. Maybe they have a course they are, they are interested in or how to find their research interest. There's a lot of school options in the US. Another thing is um, the world-class education. Like the quality of education you are getting here is like world-class. There's um, good um, technology for teaching and research irrespective of whatever interest or whatever research you, are, you, you plan to go into. Also, another thing is that um, the US has the greatest number of international students in the world. I mean, the last time I checked, there's a lot of um, international students here. So it's not like, oh, it's just you or there's a lot of people here. So you feel like, yeah, you're kind of home. So another option is um, cultural diversity. What I mean by that is that, uh, like, let's, let's say for my class now, there's a lot of different people from different parts of the world like different continents you you come here you don't come here and you're like oh i'm the only nigerian like okay in Purdue, for example there is i can't even say but we have we have a great nigerian community so coming here you know as much as oh you, you're in america and yeah you're trying to network there's also a lot of people that are like you there's a lot of nigerians a lot of indians a lot of koreans chinese and there's a lot of people over here so yeah and also Employment opportunities. Uh, in the US, depending on what long-term goals you have, there's a lot of employment opportunities available to you. Like, um, let me say for myself, I'm currently on an internship in California, and um, I mean, that's an opportunity. So um, the next thing I would be talking about, I'll be talking about funding opportunities in the US. So to, to explain this, um, firstly, I would be comparing this to um, what people know of scholarships, like when, when it comes to scholarships in Europe, for example, if you get a scholarship in the Europe, I don't think you have any obligations or whatever. The government maybe pays for your tuition and yeah, you go to school. But when it comes to the US, people need to understand that there, there's like, you have to understand assistantships and you have to understand fellowships so that you understand what exactly it is you're applying to. When someone tells you they have a scholarship in the US, they're either telling you that they have a teaching assistant, assistantship, or maybe they have a research assistantship, or maybe they are on a fellowship. So I'll be explaining this um, so you can have some understanding about that. When it comes to teaching assistantship, it's like, you are working for a professor, maybe um, the professor is taking a course and you are working as a TA. Now, as a TA, your roles include maybe helping the professor in class, helping him to grade his um, grade um, the students and assisting students in the um, laboratories or stuff like that. So that is teaching assistantship. And to go back, these assistantships are usually like 0.5 FTE. And what this means is that you are eligible to work 20 hours in a week. Working in the US time usually is 40 hours in a week, but if you are working on a scholarship, you have the um, eligibility to work 20 hours in a week and that is 0 0.5. So if you get a funding letter and you see oh, 0 0.5 FTE, it only means that, oh, you're eligible to work um, 20 hours in a week. Um, sorry, there's a noise coming, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, so like there's some noise coming from somewhere. So um, when it comes to research assistantship, now this is also working for a professor, but in this case, a professor has, so how professors 
work is that they have funding from different projects and they would definitely need someone to work on that project. It could be like maybe your research interest and they need someone to work on them, work with them on that project. So that is a research assistantship. Now, teaching assistantship, or let me say, yeah, TA generally, like when it comes to teaching assistantship, usually you don't even need to reach out to the professor. When you see people reaching out to professors for, um, the professor, my name is this, 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 it is because they want to work with the professor, right? If the professor has some sort of funding, he's going to fund you to work as an RA. But a lot of schools, or let me say some schools, most schools that I know, when they've already, like, when you, if you don't reach out to any professor or anything, the school considers some people for teaching assistantship. And some schools, they consider like all their PhD students, like they just place you on a TA or something like that. So I think I've, I've been able to explain what TA and research, um, research assistantship means. For fellowship, um, fellowship usually is like no obligation that there's different, there's a lot of fellowships here. There are some that you are able to be offered to, or there are some that you have to come here and then you apply to different fellowships. Like for me, I got a REST fellowship, but uh, that one was given to me before I came into the US. Like you can work one year without working for any professor. You just focus on your research and stuff like that. But there are also some fellowships that are administered an assistantship whereby you need to work. Like you still need to work even though, but when it comes to taxing, like um, tax in the US, you're not gonna be taxed for that. Like, I don't want to go deep into that, but I think I've like given a general overview about um, funding opportunities in the US. So I'll, I'll go ahead to talk about the opportunities. Like, how do you know if the program has funding? I mean, if you want to, first, to be honest, you have whatever you do, like you're in Nigeria and you have to be, you have to be willing to put in work in, in a lot of like searches and you have to also be smart, like, you have to be smart, smart, like normal legal smart. So like, if you want to know if, if your program has funding, you go, you go to a school website, you check, you get the number, you get the um, graduate coordinator, you reach out, always reach out to graduate coordinators, like always reach out to graduate coordinators. Sorry, That's it's going to say that. If you check the website, if anything. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you again. It seems uh, your full screen mode is disabled now. Please, could you? I mean, uh, put your slide on the Seriously? screen. Thank you. I'm sorry to bother you. What is wrong? What is going on? Yeah, I think what. How about now? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's fine now. Okay, go ahead, please. Now? Is it good now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, sure good it's good. Now. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I don't know. All right. I don't know what's wrong. Okay. Uh, let me know if it's not good again, just call my attention to it. So like I was saying, um, you go to the website, to the graduate school's website, you check for um, the GC. If there's most of the websites, they tell you that, okay, most of our students are going to be placed on assistantship or something like that. Another thing you can, and to, to give a, a, a brief background, the two admissions in the US were master's admissions, even though like one is a PhD track, I can choose to transition into a PhD, but the two funded um, admissions I got, because I had other, I, had, I applied to like seven to eight schools, and I think I got into the eight schools, but I, I pushed, I got funding in like two of the schools, and the two schools were master's like funding. So if you want to know, how do I know if the program have fun? Like if I want to know, I go to the website, I check if there's, if there's no information there. I try to reach out to the graduate coordinator. That is the first thing you want to be doing. Hello, my name is this. Does the program offer funding? If it offers funding, they'll tell you it's priority funding. You just have to do your homework and make sure you submit before the priority deadline. Like it's, if the, they, can't, they will not lie to you that the program does not have funding. Another thing you can do is if you have opportunity to reach out to existing student, but I don't think I did anything of such. Every information you need, you can get from the graduate coordinators. Like that is what they do. There is no stupid questions. Like, except if you're asking obvious questions that were maybe on the website. So ask them this question. Um, does there is no shame in asking for funding like because i know like there is no shame 
please, does the program offer funding? That's a good question. They will tell you if it does or not. Financial aid, is it available? And when do you ask for funding? For all the schools that I trying to apply to, the first thing I did, there is no hiding it. The first thing I did for all the schools was reach out to the graduate coordinator with a list of questions just to get clarification. And in all of those questions, the first question I always ask, please, does the school offer funding? Sometimes if you're applying for masters, you can specify it for masters. Like there is no need to hide it or whatever. Like ask them anytime, even before you submit an application, you should have an idea whether the school is gonna give you funding even before you submit application. Like, so do I need to apply for funding separately or am I being considered for funding automatically? I mean, it depends on the school you are applying to. Some schools, when they give you admission, the funding comes together with it. Some you have to like still email the professors or um, still reach out to a lot of people and ask them when the funding decisions is gonna, is gonna come out. I think for most of the cases that I know, the uh, if it is not a PhD, the decision is going to come and then you have to like start hustling for funding. Yeah, you have to hustle. So. I mean, and some, if it is a PhD, especially, it's going to come with your letter, like just at once. So all of these things depend on the school you are applying to. But like I would always say, there is funding in the US, you just have to know how to find it. Like there is funding. There are some, there, there are some times when you go to the um, school's website, you go to the professor's profile. Under their profile, they will tell you, I'm working on a couple of funded, um, I, I'm working on a couple of projects now that, are, that have funding, reach out to me, but you have to put in that work. Like you have to do a lot of work to streamline this, um, this course. So I will go to application requirements. I, I'm just like taking generally um, what it could be, this is not like limited to one school. It depends on who you are applying to also. This, um, how strong is your application? Like how strong is your application? Your CV, um, you see, I'm going to like the ones I check mark, I'm going to buttress more on it. So most times you have to submit a CV and then your transcripts, you have to get your transcripts from the school. Most times you can use your own official transcripts. I know for all my applications, I do, I got my, my transcript eventually, but when you start emailing professors, you want to apply your transcript, you can apply the unofficial and tell them well, I've applied my unofficial transcript to this, but eventually you want to make sure you get your transcript from the school and submit it. And even if it is the unofficial or whatever, you can just ask them just to know. But I would advise you to work on getting your transcript because like, I know a lot of people had like some issues with this because some of the portals will tell you have to submit the official and stuff like that. And um, the standardized test, I think Haniel has already spoken about this. Personally, I didn't take the GRE, even though I studied a lot for it. I, I studied so much for GRE. I took a lot of tests, but I wasn't able to take the GRE. I think like it was, I was just running out of time and it was during the NSAS protest then. I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to go take only the English test. So I went to take the TOEFL and that was the only thing I used. And even the TOEFL I took, most of the schools didn't really needed it, but I, I submitted it and I can say the TOEFL was the one that helped me get the teaching assistantship I got from Oregon State University. And it, I don't think it had any influence in Purdue University because to be honest, it wasn't required. Like, I don't think, I don't, I, I'm not sure I submitted, I think maybe I submitted it, but uh, yeah, but Haniel has already said it. I also advise a lot of people to take this standardized test if they can. And, it depends on how strong you think your application is. Like when I say how strong you like, when I when when I ask someone if I want to know how strong someone's application is, if I ask you to send me your CV, and if you can give me your LinkedIn link, I can have some idea about how strong your application is. Like I tell people, how strong is your application? If someone doesn't take a GRE, doesn't mean like. Maybe the person has a backup or something else they are trying to rely on because all of these things are points. It's like you are taking jump, why can is there's a lot of points attached to it. Like what's your leadership? What's your volunteering experience? What's your work experience? What are all of these things? So and that in this diversity essay, um, some schools ask for this. They just want you to um, show what you have done, maybe to help a diverse community. Like if you're a black person, like just explain something that you've done to your community, why they why they should take you to the school, like, and things that you could do like to help the diversity generally. Like, I know 
for the university asks for it, but I don't think if I don't know if it is um, important to submit it. And that thing is writing sample. Writing sample is maybe a paper or maybe your final project. And I so I mean I submitted this for a couple of schools. They would want you to, they just want to see how like maybe if you have a paper, then you can you it's like it's totally helpful. They just want to see if you can like write something or write a paper or stuff like that. So you can use your final project. I always use that because I personally didn't have any publication before I came to grad school. So I always use my um, final year project. So statement of purpose, I'll also be elaborating on that a little bit. So, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I'm on time. I'm working with time. So and recommendation letters, this is also um, a requirement and application fees. So I think these are like generally everything you want to make sure that is in check if you want to start your journey in graduate school. Like these are the things that are gonna be in the portal when you, once you create your application. These are like some major things that are gonna be there. So, um, so building your academic um, CV, if you want to build your academic CV, I just made this just to elaborate on what I've said previously. Uh, Education, this is like something that worked for me. I plan to share my CV, but I think because of time, I was planning to share a screen of my CV just to show like an overview of how my CV was. Um, you want to put your education, you want to put like ranking or what it depends to be honest. And I I had a 4.48 um, CPA from FUTA, but I always bank on my ranking because I graduated third in my class. So it depends on what you think like, it. See, it doesn't really matter, like I said. Even if your CGPA is not like, I mean, I had a two one. Even if your CGPA isn't, even if it is a two two, like I always say, depends on how strong you can make your application to be. If your CGPA isn't that good to be on, maybe you don't want to put it, you don't want people to just see that first. There are other things that can support, like there is a lot. US is not about, um, it's, not, it's not necessarily about your maybe graduating top or something like that. There is a lot of, you have to prove it. There's a lot of other sites that you can show. I mean, like Haniel said, there's a lot of people, a couple of our friends that are here that had two, two, but what did they do? They made the application solid. Like they want to rely on other strengths. You need to prove that the reason why you have a low CGPA is not because you don't know, like it's not because <laughs> it's because like maybe something happened. You have to prove it that, okay, I can do this. That's the only thing that they need. Graduate school is not about maybe, um, I wouldn't say it's about CGPAs, yeah. It's about you ready to put in the work. So publications, if you have, I didn't have a publication, so I didn't have any publication on my CV. Research experience, if any, I didn't put any research experience in my CV and that was because I was more banking on my teaching experience. Teaching experience can help you get a teaching assistantship. They just wanna see if you may have some experience and this teaching experience is not like maybe you went to be a teacher in the school. Teaching experience can be you tutoring your classmates when you were in, when you were in the university or maybe just if you know you you some sort of teaching, you can add that it helps you for teaching assistantship, industrial or work or work experience, or I had a couple of work experience. You can add this, just um, add this if you have it. Volunteer activities, this is very, very important. They want to see that it's not just about book. What are the things that you, you have done? I tell people, even if you are preparing for grad school, you can start doing some of these things, like just start incorporating it, start build, start doing things that can eventually help your application. Leadership experience. I know there are like there are some people that didn't utilize this when they are in school, but I don't know if the people that are listening to me, if some of them are still in school, try to get some sort of leadership experience. Like it could be anything. Your NYSE period, you can get leadership experience. Like just try to do something. Try to put yourself in that position so that it can help your, it can make your CV look good. These are the things that give you points. Awards and honors, you can add this. Professional membership is also very, very important. It's very, very important, like even in the US. Educational learning, um, massive open online um, courses. This is very, very important. Like these are the things you should be doing once you finish grad. Like if you if you are not still in the university, these are the things you should be doing in anticipation to going to grad school. Conferences, if you have skills, you can add your software and equipment proficiency. Hobbies and language. This is a simple CV template that I've given. Like just make it academic. Like everything straight to the point. 
So um, the next thing I'll be talking about, I'll be talking about the statement, okay, print management. I'll be talking about statement of purpose. Every school has its own requirement and standard and also structure is very, very important to be honest. Like when you read a good SOP, you know, like, like the more you write SOPs, the more you tend to understand it. Like the, the day I learned, like for me, SOPs were like, the day I discovered the cheat code to SOP, like just flow, like from one paragraph to another. The person after reading your first paragraph should be willing to read the next paragraph, should be willing to read the next paragraph. The person should not get to the third paragraph thinking, what are you talking about? Like, like everything, you should link up all your CV. So this is the structure sample that I've created that worked for me and that I've explained to other people that I think that it's, because it's kind of confusing. I know the first time I go back to read my first SOP that I ever wrote, like it was, even when I read it now, I know that what, what, what was I writing like, really? So um, the first paragraph, I would say like, what motivated you to pursue your field of interest? This is very vital. Like, this is like, the first paragraph should not be like just a cliche. There's a lot of, I see a lot of statement of purpose. People are quoting stuff from Google, like according to the word, can you come? No, like you have 500 words to be great. Like, why are you talking about something from Google? Like, like you wanna, you want to like show yourself, like you want to like show things that, show a lot of things that you've done. You want to praise the school. You, is, you, you won't just make it about yourself, make it about, you know what, let me just go back to the um, structure sample. If I want to talk about SOP, I'll go on and on again because there's a lot of SOPs that are just not good. So you have to you have to get it right. Your SOP is very important, no typos. This is very, very important. Your SOP, that is like your face in the um, admission application process. So what did you work on? The second paragraph, you can make it like, what did you work on in your undergrad? And what competencies have you developed? I can say, oh, I carried out a project in that topographical information system. So I was able to acquire this. And this is just like, I'm coming from, from something that motivated me to that field of interest. Like, so I'm linking it together. And why are you interested in that field? This is like your past. So like I said, like the, the first one is personal, make it a little bit personal, make it about yourself. The second one is your past. And the third paragraph, what is your research interest? You have to be very clear about it. Like you have to be very clear about it. I submitted an application and the professor reached out to me and was like, your goals are very clear. You know what you want. Like you have to be very clear about it. I mean, I also hope to show this one, but I don't think I can. So what is your research interest and what tools can help you in solving or investigating it? How did it lead to your decision to apply to the school? Have you discovered a faculty of interest whose work aligns with your interest? Link paragraph two to three, this is like, it's very good for you if you have identified the faculty of interest. I know sometimes like someone asked, sometimes the professors do not respond. And to be honest, it's, it's not because your, your, your email is bad. I know most of the professors that I reach out to, they also respond to me. I know for that for sure, but I know some that never did. And I end up didn't apply to the school. I mean, it's a game of numbers. And um, the fourth one is what is your long-term goal what have you done up to this moment that has prepared you for grad school? Is your future like what are you looking forward to? Like, if you have big dreams, you can add it there. And the last paragraph is what would now you, in, in this paragraph is all about hope and praises. Praises like you want to like you want to like psych the school. You want to like make them look very great. What would the program? do for you? Does it help you achieve your goals? Why did you choose the school, the ranking, be assertive and confident you are fit for the program? You want to tell them that I'm confident that I'm the right fit for the program, blah, blah, blah. You want to say that, oh, the school is, has a great KS World ranking. Oh, the school has a world, great world facility. Oh, the school is in a good country, is, is in a good state that has this. Like, they want to see that, oh, you are actually like very, very interested in coming to this school. They want to see that. So, okay, I just put a first paragraph sample of my own SOP. This is the, this is the first paragraph sam sample for all my SOPs, even the one I use for Erasmus. Like, this is the sample that I used. Um, I got motivated to pursue excellence at a young age, blah, blah, blah. This is what I, my first paragraph, like, for me, I just, and also you need to also understand, in as much as there's a difference between, I don't know if people know that, but I 
that there's a difference between a personal statement and a motivational letter and a statement of purpose. But also it all boils down to the school. When you go to the graduate website and you go to that, there is always, the school will tell you the requirements, what they want. They will tell you some, even some of the schools will tell you um, what is something that's a, that has happened to you. They want to, some, some of them want to know about your background. Like maybe you are not from a very like well rich family like that. They will tell you to, like some of them want you to include it. They will put the requirements there. And the, some of the schools, like I, I'll always say, if the school is requiring for 500 words, I think Hanel said that also, you want to make sure you keep it to 500 words. If the school says two pages, you want to keep it to two pages. I know some schools require two pages. And for me, I always like to keep it 500 words. I mean, you don't want to bore the reader. Whatever you want to write, if you can, I know sometimes you have a lot of things to say, but it's, if you if you have Grammarly, like if you, if you write your statement of purpose, make sure you have a Grammarly subscription. You can you can like get with a friend or something like that. Make sure to always check your statement of purpose for typos. You don't want your statement of purpose to have typos. You, you if there are some some things some things we can say in like two lines or three lines, you can actually say it in one line. So, um, Grammarly is really really helpful with that. So, um, sending emails to professors, I think Hanel covered about this. Okay, uh, I'm not sure. You want to, the subject is very, very important. You want to make sure your email has a subject. You can say for 21 prospective graduate students, 42 prospective graduate, graduate student inquiry, depending on who you are sending it to. Timing is very, very important. Like you want to make sure you have a, a I always use the time zone converter app to always check the location of my professors. You want to send this, emails at the right time. I mean, me, I always I get like after 8 a.m. in the morning when I know the professor is going to be in the office. Like you want to check the time zone. You want to make sure that you don't want to send the email like midnight when the professor is sleeping. And I mean, I just, for me, I just feel like timing is very, very important. You want to make sure you are sending it at the right time. You don't want to be sending the email at 5 p.m. when maybe the professor is leaving his office. Also, you want to read papers ahead to be familiar with research and aligns with your interests. I mean, you have to do this. Yes, you want to jack my but graduate school is a lot of work. Like you have to be ready to put in the work, to be honest. Like it's a lot of work. People don't read really webinars about that, but it's a lot of work, right? You have to put in the work. So you have to read these papers just to be familiar with the person's research. They want to see that, oh, oh, you are really interested. Oh, you can say oh, in your paper, blah, blah, blah. They want to see some sort of interest. I mean, even though some people might not be interested. So you want it simple. I don't want to make it bubbles. You don't want to make it long. Like, you don't, even me, if you send me an email, uh, maybe I'm lazy, I don't know. But if you send an email to me that it's like more than like, when you look at your phone and the email is going down, like on one screen of, the, of your phone, if you have a smartphone, you should be able to see like, everything and even if there is anything left it should not be more than one paragraph beneath it shouldn't be like very long no no you want the professor to know about what you've done but no that is not the way to go about it you want to be very successful and like you want to be very straight and professors don't they don't i don't don't like long emails no you have to be very formal as formal as possible and also your prior work experience you can highlight this you can attach your cv and transcript and any other relevant document that helps a case and you want to keep it strictly formal i have 10 minutes left this is a sample that i made just um sending to a professor you just want to tell him i have a keen interest blah 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 your name your cgpa if you don't want to put your cgpa it is not compulsory to put in your gpa it depends like i said it depends on what you think like if you have an experience or research experience or a work experience you can put that you can quickly talk about the person's publication you can talk about what you have done and then you just praise the school that is all if the professor is going to respond to you he's going to respond to you if he's not going to respond to you maybe i don't know but i think a lot of professors that i reach out to they actually responded to me some will tell you oh can you also reach out to this professor oh i'm retiring oh i'm not taking students at this time oh yeah you can apply oh so this is 
this is a sample to um, GC. Like I said, you want to always reach out to graduate coordinators. Some questions that you're asking your friends, you can ask the graduate coordinator. Those ones, you can email them as much as, see, that is what they are paid for. They are waiting for people to ask them questions because that means they are working. You want to ask any questions you have any kind of question you have just to clear your doubts, but we don't want to go asking questions that are like too obvious. This is a sample question. Do I need to secure a private supervisor to be considered for admission? Do I need to know this? Uh, what are the specific test calls? Um, see the issue about transcripts. Am I going to consider for application fee waiver? In as much as um, application fee waivers, I wouldn't say that, um, uh, I wouldn't say that it's, it's too good. It's too good. Yeah, but I mean, it worked, it worked for some, for me. I don't think I, for all the schools that I applied to, I didn't pay a dime. The only school that I paid a dime, I didn't even like get any funding from them. So, uh, I mean, you have to, you don't want to rely 100% on application fee waiver. I would say that you don't want to rely 100% application fee waiver. But if you know your way around and you believe in your application and you are, yeah. So um, I'll be talking about the timeline overview. Yeah, I'm trying to work with time. I'll be talking about the timeline overview for application. First, you want to understand the US semesters. Um, we have the fall, we have the spring, and we have the summer. For the fall, this starts like in mid-August. I know a lot of people are coming to the US by August now. Those are the ones that are that, that applied for fall of um, 2022. They are resuming, they are going to start resuming soon. The, the semester starts mid-August to early September. And for fall, um, for fall semester, the applications are mostly open for false resumption. And what do I mean by that is that like most of the schools or all, I don't want to be so direct, like you can apply for into fall like you want to come to the us in fall so you can the applications are usually open and fall is the first semester of the year of the academic year also the most financial aids are offered during this period this is the best this is the time you want to hustle for this is the time you should be looking forward to if you want to start applications for fall of 2023 you should have started like two months ago or three months ago, or I don't know, like you should have started. Spring semester, this one starts in January. And also not all schools accept applications for spring semester. What do I mean by this? Not all, some schools will tell you, we don't accept application for spring semester. So you can't, you can't I don't know, except if you are a US citizen and you, you are paying for yourself or something. But not all schools accept applications for spring semester. This is also the second um this is also the second semester of the academic year. And funding opportunities or financial aids, they are lesser in the fall, like they are low. So your chances, if you're this for getting funding in the fall is maybe uh 50%. The chance your chances in spring is like 20% or 15%. I know a lot of people get admission in the fall and they move it to the spring. Or maybe they defer to spring. And I mean, there's there's a couple of people. If you reach out to a professor, if you know you are reaching out to a professor to fund you, then your chances in spring is good. If the professor is interested, he can take you. If you need a student, he can take you. Um, for summer, it starts in late May to early June. Currently, we are in summer. That's where a lot of people are in internships. A lot of people are back in school doing research. Uh, a lot of people are not taking classes. There's a lot of special programs. You see a lot of school exchange, the Mandela. Like, there's a lot of things going on in summer. Like, this is, like, just a flex um, semester, and that is the end of session. So the major pre-application tax, um, because I, would, I made a timeline overview generally after this, just to guide people on how to plan for themselves, especially people that are focusing on fall 23. Um, you want to, I can't see my, sorry. Okay. So you want to get your international passport. I think that is, if anybody is applying for fall of 2023 and they currently do not have an international passport, then I don't know if they are ready enough because when you see that passport, it's going to like motivate you to actually like, like when you look at that passport, you don't want that passport to just be lying around and wasting away in the house. So it's going to like push you a lot. 
So you want to get your international passport. These are like pre-application tax that are major that you have to make sure you do. You have to budget some money for application fees. This is an investment. You have to be willing to do it. You have to be willing to pay some money for your application fee. I know it's very, very hard. So that's why like there's, I know there's um, like Hanyo, you go into the, oh, there's a lot of opportunities for people to get um, support. And also if you are doing your NYC, that's a good period. I know I had a lot of money for this graduate school journey. Like it's a lot of money, to be honest. It's a lot of money. Like from the moment you start applying to the moment you start getting decisions, you have to book for flights, you have to pay service, you have to pay visa. It's a lot. So I know the, a lot of money that I made during NYSC and the work I started before I left Nigeria, most of that went into my application. Like you have to be willing to invest in yourself. So you want to identify target schools and their requirements, at least seven schools, and you want to classify them accordingly. When I say classify them accordingly, you have like the um, ambitious schools, like schools like that are ambitious. I don't want to like list their new schools or something. But you want to classify these schools into three categories. Some are like medium, some are like low. I wouldn't say low, like low, low Nigerian standard, like, like just, you know, humble, uh, medium, and then ambitious. Like you want to classify those schools. When I say at least seven, there are a lot of people apply to like 20 schools. Like people apply to, well, I apply to maybe just seven schools or six, seven or six. So, but you want to apply to, I would say, at least seven, like at least seven. Somebody can apply to one school and get to one school. Somebody can apply to 20 schools and get into one school. Like it depends. Just like classify them. You don't want to apply, only apply to just ambitious schools. And at the end of the day, you say, oh, this school, I didn't know that this school is highly competitive. Like, so you want to apply um, to, you want to classify them. You want to attend a lot of graduate school webinars. This is very, very helpful. Should I'm running out of time. You want to you want to attend graduate school webinars. This is very very important. You can get waivers from these, even though I say it is not the good route to go, but you want to utilize the. I mean, you know, like free thing. Contact all graduate coordinators for cl clarification on requirements. Prepare for standardized tests. Code email to professors. We want to identify recommenders and stay in touch. You want to prepare a well structured CV. You want to work on your LinkedIn profile. You want to submit the application as early as possible. Finally, um, I made a table for this. Uh, this is an 18 month plan. I think I started preparing for grad school the moment I was in camp, NYC camp, they sent us home because of COVID. That was around March. Yes, you want to start as early as possible. Like you don't want to wait till, if you haven't started now, like you just think you have time, but want to start as early as possible. A lot of people that got into, they started like, as early as possible. So between this March to May period, you want to research various schools that are aligned to your intended study. You want to work towards getting your passport. You want to identify potential recommenders. You want to be in the right groups. You want to be in the right WhatsApp group. This is very, very important. I think I was in the same group with Hanyo. I remember all those times we were preparing for um, GRE together and to feel like you have to be in the right group. You have to build the right relationship. Your friends have to like, your, you have to be friends, you have to make new friends. Your friends should be friends, your current friends now should be friends that also want to apply for scholarships because that is where you get information from. You people will share information with each other. Like those are, those are the kind of relationships you want to be building at that moment. You want to have friends with people that have similar goals. This is very, very important. By the June, um, August, you want to take as much practice test as possible. Hanel has talked about this. You want to apply for your transcript. You want to start working on your SOP. You want to attend as much graduate webinars as you can. If you don't know, there's a, there's a graduate webinar that you host every year. This is the best place to be. Make sure you do not miss it. It's going to be out soon. I don't know. The time Time, but you want to be there, there, there. Like there's a lot of schools in the US, like plenty of schools are gonna be there. You go from one Zoom room to another, you ask them, them straight questions. Ask them, can I apply? Do I need this to apply? Do they ask them anything? That was where we were hustling for weavers and I know people don't like weavers. So by September to December, you want to write and rewrite and rewrite and review and repeat your SOP. You want to use Grammarly to scrutinize it. You want people to review your SOP for you. You want to start submitting applications. Most priority deadlines are between this month. Priority deadlines usually depends on the school. Most are like around December 5 up to like December 31st. 
and you want to keep emailing professors and grad coordinators, keep asking them, you want to discover new schools, this is, you can do this through WhatsApp group and through your friends. You want to apply to as many schools as possible. Second priority deadline is in January and February. I know for Oregon State University, I applied after the deadline. Sometimes when you see deadline, still email the graduate coordinator. I emailed the graduate coordinator, hello, uh, I missed the priority deadline, can I apply? And she said, go ahead. Sometimes you don't know that there is a second priority deadline. People don't know this. So some deadlines go as far as March. Keep applying. Apply if you miss the deadline or discover a school. Update, update. If you secure the professor, you want to update that professor. Oh, hello, professor. This I've already submitted my application. Then you can await decisions from schools by January to March. Like decisions are going to start rolling in at this time. And school interviews, like those are like the interview Hanel talk about, like with professors. By April to August, you want to request your I 20, you want to start filling your DS160, you want to create your CGI profile, you want to pay service, you want to prepare a lot for your visa interview, you want to get your visa, you want to book your flight, and you want to stay safe for a lot of things. Yeah, you don't want to fall inside gutter. Then by August, welcome to America. So, Thank you for listening. I think that's all. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, thank you very much. Um, that will be all for me. Okay, thank you so much, Scholar uh, Zainab. Scholar Abib, are you there? Scholar Abib? Yeah, I think uh, Scholar Bib is away. So why we are expecting him? Okay, we can't hear you. Okay, yes, great. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, great. You're welcome, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Scholar Zain. We are very grateful for this insight lecture. More parts here. So we are now going to the question and answer section. So before we go to the question and answer section, we have uh, Scholar Neon and Scholar Zainab as able to make justice to how to A to Z on how to secure a fully funded scholarship in the United States of America by following our normal overview uh, about GRE, how to pass GRE, how to message professor, how to ace interview with the professors. They have already talked about many things about what you need to know about the graduate school application in the United States of America. So I'm going to start with the question right now. Sorry. Scholar Zainab, please, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. OK. I can hear you. So the first question, the first question is from Ura Robinson David. He asked that, can someone with a CGPA of 2.89 out of five and MSc CGPA of 3.5 get a fully funded scholarship in the US? Yes, you can get a fully um, funded scholarship in the US for sure. You can get, I mean, um, the, the one, the two, there are like three people I know actually. And I think one of them had a two point something um, scholarship. I mean, what you want to do is, is the person willing to take a GRE and a TOEFL? Because you have to take a GRE if you have a, um, a CGPA like that. Because And the reason is because you want to pass the GRE and you want them to see that, oh, I mean, I can pass the GRE. The reason for the low CGPA is not because I don't know what I'm doing. So for sure, you can get a fully funded PhD um, scholarship here in the US. Like, And also, you want to try and get um, in touch with someone that has a similar situation as you so that they can also assist you very well. But I'm confident that you can get a funded scholarship here, like, I mean, with your CGPA. All right. This second question goes to Alale Atoyi. He said, is it possible to get funding without contacting professor because professors are not responding? Um. Yes. So I personally didn't contact any professor in Oregon State University. I just contacted the graduate coordinator because when I reached out to her, she told me, you don't need to secure any professor to apply. So when I applied and when I got the admission, I then reached out to a professor. 
and he responded to me. So if the professor is not responding, I know there are some schools that I reach out to professors and they were not responding. And because of that, I didn't apply. And the reason is this, when I reached out to the graduate coordinator, can I apply without um, um, a professor? For example, University of Alabama Geographical Sciences will tell you, you must secure a professor. If a school tells you that you must secure a professor before applying, then I don't want to waste my money. So, but if the school didn't tell me that, for sure I'm going to submit my application and it doesn't matter. They, they don't make it mandatory. So you have to be sure. Is the school telling you that you must secure a professor? If the school tells you, if the school doesn't tell you that, then you can submit your application and mention even the professor's name in your application. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there age limits for applying for funding in the United States of America? No, 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 no. There is no age limit. There's a lot of people here that are, they have like businesses in Nigeria with their kids and they came here and they got scholarships. They got fund, funded. There is no age limit in the U.S. It's not 18. I don't think it's 18 here. There's a lot of elderly people here that are currently on scholarships. They have kids. It's, I don't think there's no age limit here. The only thing is you have, the only thing is if you want to go for your, I mean, if you get a fully funded scholarship and you want to go for your visa interview, then, I mean, you already have a leverage, right? But if you want to come on self-funding with maybe you are already like an elderly person, then you have to be ready to explain some things in the visa interview, but I don't think it's a problem. All right. So Ajani Sadiq has this question. He said, can he get a, an application fee waiver for Purdue University? Oh, oh yeah, Purdue gives application fee waivers every year. And this is how you get it. You have to attend the um, 10 graduate school exposition. It happens every year. And that is what I mentioned that it is very important to attend because there's a lot of other schools that are going to be there, like top schools and normal schools and whatsoever. So if you are able to attend that um, webinar, that exposition, they will ask you to submit some stuff. Like you just explain what did you learn from the webinar? Once you're able to submit that, the next instant they will send you a code for your application fee waiver. So yeah, Purdue does that every year. So that is how you want to get it. You want to wait for the exposition to come. All right. So another, another question from Felix is that, what is the maximum recommended page for academic CV? Well, you don't want to go beyond two pages. That is advisable, except if you are someone with exceptional, I don't know, three pages, maybe for a PhD, but most people, two pages, like you don't want to go beyond two pages. That is what I advise, except if maybe you want to apply for some PhD programs and they're in the requirement, maybe they say three pages or something, but everything you want to write should fit into two pages. Yeah. All right. Uh, from Toy, uh, from uh, is it Toy? Okay. Good evening. How can I search for school to start code mailing professors? How can you search for schools? Yes, that's the question. So the way I search for schools, I mean, Google is your friend. Like I know. Of, um, there's a lot of other sites like Princeton Reviews, US News, all those, all those um, sites. But I didn't like Google, like if you can use Google very well, like, you know, you know, there's actually, there's actually, there are actually people that don't know how to use Google. Like if you want to search for something, if you studied, um, let's say you study, uh, okay, let me use myself as an, ex as an example. I studied surveyor and geophysics in school. But you don't want to you don't want to search for schools and start looking for masters in surveying and geoinformatics. No, you want to search for like what research interest do you have? You want to search for maybe masters in maybe geographical something, geospatial science, or you want to search for masters in remote science. Like, what is your research interest? So that is the way I go to school. I I, I search for schools like I just search like schools with 
if I just type schools with MS um, or, PhD, or PhD civil engineering USA, there is a lot of sites that are going to pop up. Like there is a lot, like there, there's so much schools or maybe you can go even to the ranking. There's a, when you go to KS ranking, there's a lot of schools in the US that you see. But for me, I just advise you to like, just what do you want? Of course, what research interest do you have? Masters and PhD in immunology USA is going to bring a lot of things for you. If you have a PhD in building information modeling, it's going to bring a lot of stuff for you. Masters in this business is going to bring a lot of stuff for you. So, and then you explore, you, you list them out. So that's how, that's how I go about it. So another question, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So what, what should be the maximum number of page for a recommendation letter? A recommendation letter also, like I would also say, I would suggest a page. Like everything your recommender wants to write should be, I mean, the person sometimes I will tell you it has to be on, um, what do they call this? On the school, um, can you give me the word? Like the school's um, letterhead, sorry. So it has to be in the letterhead. So even if it goes beyond the page, maybe half a page, but you you don't want to write a letter like two pages, like, no, just all my letters were one page. And I even tried to make them one page together with, the, I consider the letterhead, um, page um, the letterhead format so like you want to tell your recommender please uh, like um this is how just tell them but i don't think two pages is you don't want to write like two exhaustive pages of recommendation like i don't think so you want to limit to one page yeah one page all right uh this message uh, this uh question is from mike is gre and tofu needed for phd application Well, I think Kanyel has already spoken about GRE and TOEFL. I, I, I don't want to talk from, like, I just want to talk from the perspective of you doing whatever it takes to strengthen your application. I don't want to talk about from my own perspective or perspective of people that I know that didn't, I mean, there are people that didn't take GRE or TOEFL, but they got into graduate school. But I don't want to talk about from that perspective. I think Kanyel has done justice to that. It's advisable. Take it, except if you know there is no way for you to take it. And if you know that your application is solid, I mean, when you look at your application, if you feel that your application is competitive enough, then, but I advise people to take GRE and TOEFL. I mean, to be honest, except, I don't know, I just advise people to do their best to take it. That is my, that is my opinion about that. All right. Another question is, this person has that, is it, is it possible? Is I'm coming? I can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. You are saying that for those that want to apply for Fortune 2023, does it, is, too, is it too late? Does it just people that are trying to apply no, for no. Fortune? No, no, no. <laughs> No, I didn't say it's too late. I didn't say it's too late. I was just saying that if you wanted to apply for 423, you should have started. I expect you to have started by two months ago. Like you should have started preparing by two months ago. That is just what I said. I didn't say it's too late. I mean, people decide to start applications even like a few months to, I'm just saying that you should have, by now you should have started whatever you want to do. If you want to take a GRE, you need like three months. Some people use two months. Like everything has to be like in stages, right? Like you want to make sure that you've gotten your, you don't want to start rushing to get your passport. You don't want to start rushing to start looking for somebody that will recommend you. It's not too late. I'm just saying that you should have had it in mind. You don't want to think that at this point, you don't know that you're going to start applying. So you should have had it in mind that you want to start applying. So it's not too late. This month is not too late. Next month is not too late. Next two months is not too late. But please, you need to like start um, putting that in mind and start taking steps toward it, towards it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think Kanel is here also. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, okay, I can hear you now. All right. All right, this person asks, you mentioned an annual graduate webinar in the US USA. Kindly tell us when it's yeah. good. Yeah. Can I hear the question? Uh, when it will go. Yes, I can hear you. I'm trying to quickly check when it will hold. I don't know, um, Grad Expo. So it normally occurs in around, I don't know, let me, I don't know. When I, when I have the, the good date, I can like put it, but I don't know, it's it's gonna be like maybe after August, maybe August, September, it's, it holds around that time. Because um, Purdue deadline is usually in December. So they, they hold the exposition around September or October. So that is the time that they do it. But it's very advisable to attend it. It's, go, it's called, you can tell them to Google um, Grad Expo. Big Ten Grad Expo. Yeah, that's what it is called. School Expo, yeah. Uh, another question is, uh, what is the link have to guarantee a positive consideration from the selection committee? Um, can you come again? Is, like, I didn't hear that clearly. What is the least GRE score one must have to guarantee a positive consideration from the selection committee. Uh, I wish I, is Haniel here. Maybe you can answer that. I wouldn't say there is. A, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you just want to aim high. I don't know if Haniel is here and can help with that. I wouldn't want to answer that because I didn't take the GRE, but I know a lot of people try to aim towards getting a 320. That was the big, that was the big um, score that people were acing up and down in the group. So if Haniel can support with that, I don't know if he's here, but I, I don't know personally. All right. So another question from Chukwemeka. Uh, you could make us say that I finished from Futa in the year 2016 and studied biochemistry with a grade of two. Now I work with a bank. Do I still have hope for scholarship? Yeah. You have hope for scholarship. Um, I mean, there are a lot of people I know during visa interviews, there are some questions that might come up, like, um, I mean, why you have to be prepared for that part of it. You have hope for a scholarship, fine. But also when it comes to your visa interview, you have to be ready because I know people get questions like that. Like some people study a different thing, then they go and work in a different thing. And then they want to try to go back to school, to graduate school. So the viewer can ask you why, like why the why the sudden change or why the change or stuff like that. So you have the hope for scholarship. I mean, a lot of people work in the industry and they're like, okay, I want to now start going to apply for a scholarship. You definitely have a hope for scholarship, but you have to also put it in mind that if the, if a question comes, you should have a solid reason for um for wanting to go now. Like why now? They can ask you that. So you have to be prepared for that at the visa interview stage. So this message is from Adeko KD. Please, is it possible for me to get a PhD admission using a master degree? Or I didn't get that. Um, your your screen froze. So come again. Are you there? Uh, I can hear you. Almost. Okay. It's kind Please, of, yeah. Is it possible for me to? Using a master degree obtained in Nigeria, as this person has already uh, have a master degree obtained in Nigeria, can he use the master degree to apply for a PhD admission in the United States of America? Yes, yes, definitely. 
Yes, I mean, that's a good prerequisite. Yes, you can. Uh -huh. All right, this person is asking, can I message you on LinkedIn? Yeah, you can message me on LinkedIn. Yes, you can. This question is from uh, Abdulaziz. Are there scholarships, are there university in the USA for courses like MSc in quantity surveying? or construction management? I think the person is the... Um, yes, construction management. Hope you the construction management, yes. They, yes, construction management, there's a lot of schools, including Purdue. There are a lot of schools with construction management, for sure. Quantity surveying, I wouldn't say I know, but quantity surveying, you don't want to say you want to go to graduate school in quantity surveying. Um, I, I did survey in geoinformatics, close to quantity surveying, but if I want to go to graduate school, I don't want to say I'm studying quantity, so I, I don't want to say I'm looking for surveying and geoinformatics. Surveying and geoinformatics is first of all under civil engineering in the US. It's also under civil engineering in the University of Lagos. So if you want to do quantity surveying, what research interest do you have in quantity surveying? There would be a lot of professors that are in that same line with you. You need to now discover. I don't know what they're doing, what they're really doing quantity surveying, maybe costing, you have to determine what interest you have. You don't want to Google masters in quantity surveying in the US. You might not see Jack. So you want to see what is your interest in quantity surveying. Graduate school is about research. Graduate school is not about what we do in universities. Like quantity surveying is the name of the course, but what is your interest in quantity surveying? That is what you want to be searching online to find professors with similar interests as you and to find schools that offer that thing. It might be, it might not be called quantity surveying, but they might quantity surveying is definitely in the US, but it might you might not see quantity surveying. So you need to know what you are searching for, depending on what you learned in university. So what interest do you have in quantity surveying? That is what you want to be searching for, not just quantity surveying. But yeah, construction management, a lot. There's a lot of schools, including Purdue, University of Cal, Cal, Cal State, there's a lot of schools for, for construction management. All right, thank you. Uh, this question is from US Just Free. Currently, I'm running my master degree in Nigeria. In Nigeria, can I include that in my CV? Why I apply for direct PhD? I mean BSc to PhD. Oh, oh, okay. You want to apply for a direct? The, um, so meaning that if you get the direct PhD, you are ready to leave the master's degree. Mm, yeah, I mean, you can. I know for sure. I know a friend that came in the spring. He came into the same program I'm in in Purdue, and he was in the middle of his master's degree, and he left midway actually, and he applied for, um, he came here to start over. So yes, you can apply for it, even though they might ask you about it. Maybe if there's an interview or something, they, they, might, they might ask you about it, but for sure you can apply for direct PhD with your, if you want to include your master's degree, you can definitely put it there. It doesn't deter your chances or anything. I mean, it might just come up, maybe they can ask you uh, why, I don't think they even want to ask you. I mean, it's your choice. Like I said, I know a friend that came the same route. He told the professor, oh, I'm currently doing my master's, but I want to like apply to graduate school here. And he submitted his application and he came here to start his graduate program. He left in the middle of his master's degree. So yeah, you can add it to your CV. I also, I actually think it helps your case. All right. So can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you even though your network is. Right. Uh, this uh, question is from. Uh, sorry. Uh, that's where you find ourselves in Nigeria. Yeah. So can, you hear me? can you hear me right now? No more. Yeah, I can hear you. I'm trying to hear you. Yeah. As, as, a, as a master student currently on scholarship. Okay. Should I state it when writing okay. code mail to professor? 
when applying PhD in the US? Mm, as I don't get that. As a master's student currently on scratch, should I state it when writing code emails to professors or when applying? Like, I don't understand. Yes. Like, so the question is, is can you hear me? Okay. So I think it's great. Yeah, I can hear you. And so um, as a master's Thank student you, currently you. on scholarship, should I state it when um, writing code emails to professor or when applying uh, for PhD in the US? So the person wants to know whether okay. uh, during application, he, he, or, he or she should state it clearly um, uh, of his current, of, uh, current uh, master's degree. Is he okay? Yes, for sure. Yes, you should state that you are currently a master's student, but you don't want to say, I don't want to, like currently on scholarship. Like, why do you want to tell a professor I'm currently on scholarship? You can say you are a master's student for sure. You want to tell the professor that you, uh, my name is this, I'm a master's student. I'm currently studying in um, anywhere the person is studying, but there's nothing like telling the professor I'm currently on scholarship. Like. It's not a required information, but yes, for sure, you want to say you are um, currently doing your master's in a course or something like that. Yeah. Like if I want to apply for PhD currently, if I want to tell the professor, even if I want to email the professor currently, you know, all I need to say is my name is Zainab. I'm currently a master's student in Purdue University studying this, and that's it. And I, I plan to study um, apply into the PhD program under your supervision. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. yeah thank you. So I'll be buying back. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll let me quickly uh, follow up with the other right. questions. So, so uh, this question. Okay. I think he's back. All right. Please, I want to know yeah. if recommenders. Okay. Can you hear me? Please, I want to know if recommenders. Yes, I can hear you from the school. Please, I want to know if recommenders must be from the school or department I graduated from. Um, for recommenders, all that matters is some schools will tell you two academic recommenders and one professional recommenders. Some schools will tell you academic or three academic or three professional recommenders. Some schools might just tell you two recommenders, so it's left for you to want to make one of them be academic or professional. Now, depending on saying whether the person has to be from your school or department, I actually think it depends on you. For me, I, I have the opinion that it helps your case if the person is from your department and even helps your case the more if maybe the person supervises your project. I personally didn't use the person that supervised my project. I used two recommenders from my department, but if you don't have anybody from your department, I don't think it's harmful, but I just think it helps your case. Like if the person can say that, oh, I taught this person some courses for this so 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 years, something like that, it helps your case, but it's not that it's not gonna be taken. But I think it helps the case if the person is from your department or maybe your, or maybe if you've taken the person's class before, it doesn't have to be, maybe if, you've, if you've taken the person's class before, it also helps your case then the professional can be from your work. So I didn't say it has to be, but it helps your case. All right, thank you. This uh, question is from Usman. Is it right to apply for another master when I already have a master degree and I have the master on my CV? Is it okay to apply for another master? Yes, the person has already through with his master degree. Yes. So he's now asking. Is he yes. Yes, if that is what you want, if you want a second master's, I mean, people have three masters. Like, if you want a second master's, then for sure you can. I know a lot of Indians do that, but I wouldn't say they get they they like they have the idea about funding as much as Nigerians because a lot of Indians are not really funded here in the US because they don't really have as much information I would say. So um yes you can apply for a second master's degree and also I would I will always come back to it. Whatever you do whatever you get eventually when you go to your visa interview depending on the view you get 
the question can pop up. It can be an interesting question to the viewer. Oh, why do you decide to go for another master? I can see you are going for another master. So you just have to be prepared for that. But if you want a third master, you can. And you can get it. The only thing is in your SOP, if you have a master's in, I wouldn't think you want to get a master's in the same field that you got previously. Let's say you have a master's in cybersecurity. I wouldn't think you want to get a master's in cybersecurity again. So the question is, what master's are you getting? Is it a different master's? And in your statement of purpose, what are you saying about that? Like, what do you want to say about that? Like, if you want to include it in your CV, then for sure, oh, this is my interest, blah, blah, blah. Like, why are you interested in that? So it, it all boils down to, are you getting the same master's in the same um, in the same thing you got, like maybe back in Nigeria? Is it the same program? Then I think that's, that's where the question should rely on. Yeah, sorry, uh, can I quickly add? So- okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think on that, if you have, I mean, uh, any reason for you to apply for another master's program or another program that is similar to one of your previous programs. So I think it is better you state a kind of motivation as to why you want to, I mean, uh, uh, do another program. So which you've had the degree before, like uh, Scholar Zainab said, so, Although it won't be wise that you know you have a master's in cyber security before and you still want to do another master in cyber security. So though if you want to do another master and then again in the same area, then you should be able to give a provide a kind of genuine motivation. Okay, now this is where I did my master's program. So we could or during that time you were sick. So just give a genuine motivation or you didn't, the area, maybe if your master was master by research, then you can say, okay, now I couldn't enjoy the master very well because it was purely by research. So I couldn't take some uh, coursework. Then you have to take a genuine, I mean, uh, motivation. But I'm afraid if you don't provide a genuine motivation and you just apply without stating reason why you are applying, so I'm afraid you might not be considered that. So that doesn't apply to US alone. If you have a certificate before and you want to apply for another I mean, uh, program, so which are the same, it's what you've had before, then you have to state some motivation for why you are trying to apply for it. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, uh, that's right. Thank you. Well, is there anybody still there? Yes, I'm still here. Please, I want to ask this question. So sure. despite that you despite that you won an Erasmus Mundus scholarship and you are still able to secure the scholarship at the US, why do you leave Erasmus? I go, yeah, I get this question a lot. Yeah, I get the question a lot. Uh, I mean it all it all boils down to what you want eventually. I think that's for me, like what you really want. I if I look at it, if I look at Europe and the US, which one did I really wanted to go for? Then for me, it's the US. So I'm like, you know what? Let me just go straight into the US. Because even if I had gone to Erasmus, I know I would eventually want to find my way back to the US. But I think for me, and also another thing is um, how the program truly aligns to what exactly you want to do. The program I applied to was in line with my um, with my background and my interest, but I wouldn't say it was really, really, really in line with what I really wanted. Like the one I got in the US, the two programs I got into the US were more fitted to my career goals and objectives and my long-term goals. So that was why I left Erasmus for another person to get the spot. I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. So these are already past six. I don't think we are going to take much question now. I'm going to take this question and another one so that we can going to end the section for today. Yeah. This question is from Gary. Yeah, and I can get breakfast. <laughs> ah, sorry. The person said, I studied electrical and electronics engineering at undergraduate level. Can I apply for masters in mathematics 
slash applied mathematics? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. In fact, applying, um, going from electrical to mathematics is, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a sharp switch. They are like more sharper switch than that. There are people that come from like a totally different place to a different place. Like ECE to like EE rather to mathematics is like, it's, it's almost like, I don't know, like it's kind of not too sharp a switch, but also like, um, like Lukman has said also, you always want to put the reason why you are interested in mathematics and why, and you want to make sure you link it. Like, do not make it like you are making a serious or dangerous switch. Make it that this is still in line with what you were doing before. Like, oh, this is like, find a link. Find a link between it. And I'm very sure there should be a link. I mean, the things, the courses that you've taken for your this thing will be very, very helpful. I mean, I, I believe you've taken a lot of mathematics courses if you studied electrical and um, engineering. So do not make it like you are, I don't think you are making any serious switch actually. It's still like within the same revolving within the same sciences or engineering. So just make sure you state it in your, in your SOP and find the perfect link for why you are interested in that field and link it up together. So um, that is what I would say. So All right. you, can, you can apply to whatever, you can do a lot, any change you want. Just to be ready to support it. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Scholar Zaina. Begin. I'm sorry to actually. Um, I want to talk every uh, year as a mathematician, so uh, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. wow. So, so I'm, I'm afraid it might be difficult for you to switch to pure mathematics. You know, as an engineering student. So how we, I mean, I differ from Scholar Zaina, you know, she said it is easier. I, I think it's other way around. If you have your, I mean, a program or your degree in mathematics before, then I think it might be easier for you to switch to engineering and not other way around. You know, apart wow. from the wow. SOP and the situation, so, you know, they are going to check some other things like your transcript, so if you want to do your master's in yeah. uh, functional analysis, for example, now, so, you know, they might expect you to do some courses in real analysis, so metric space topology, functional analysis, and many other things, which I'm very sure engineering courses in Nigeria might not do at all. So I know majority of the, the least, or let me say, uh, the, the some, uh, some of the courses you, they are limited to uh, just uh, ordinary differential equation or partial differential equation. So it might be possible when it comes to applied mathematics, but for mathematics, I think it's not go area. But maybe there are some uh, courses like data science or statistics when you can provide the motivation or some other additional skills, like maybe you've taken part in some of the Python, or some, you know, some of these skills, programming skills, then they might allow you. So, but I'm afraid for pure mathematics, so you can't, yeah. Yeah, um, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, let me also add this, because I know some people that made like serious, I don't know much about mathematics, but I know people that made like, like serious sharp switch, like they just come from a dangerously different background and move into it another different background. And what I see that they do mostly is you want to show, like you have to have like some additional serious, maybe you have like some core certifications or maybe you have worked in some core places. You want to really show that, okay, this is why you want to make that switch. I don't know much about mathematics, but I think he, he knows more about that. So you want to make sure that it's not just you coming with your transcript, your SOP and your CV and trying to make that switch. So do you have like what it takes? Like, can you prove, do you have what it takes? Cause I know a lot of people make serious dangerous switch. And most times where they even have issues is when it comes to the visa interviews, cause they're like, why are you coming from banking to whatever? So, um, I mean, you have to decide for yourself, like you said. All right, thank you very much. 
Scholar Luma, did you have anything you want to say? Thank you. We well, uh, just to, I mean, appreciate the scholars as well as our powerful moderator, so who has been anchoring the program since uh, two hours ago. So another thing to add is that, uh, please, if you've not yet subscribed to the channel again, going forward, most of our webinar, so we'll be heard on, the, on our YouTube channel. And you know, there is another thing I want to add. So maybe today or tomorrow, so you might receive a kind of, uh, I mean, a call for talk. So for example, now if you want to participate in, I mean, our webinar series, Maybe you have topics, I mean, uh, you want to discuss, or you want to discuss something that is related to scholarship or all other academics, you know, for example, how people could write SOP. So then you can, I mean, express interest in that. I'm going to send more information about that anyway, so that uh, we can accommodate you uh, on our, our weekly series. So aside from that, I don't have any other things. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. Pro Welcome. Well, please do you have anything you want to say, sir? Scholar Hussein. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Scholar Zain. We are very grateful for this kind of uh, rare opportunity. So I wish you uh, successful academic uh, in your study. I just want to I wish to meet you in person, but you are currently in the US. Currently <laughs> <laughs> in Nigeria, but you are always a Fitarian, but I'm yeah, not but... Uh, No, you are going to see the United of America sooner. I hope so. So yeah. thank you very much. We are waiting for you, no problem. There's a lot of Fitarians here in the US. Wow, yeah. that's it. We are waiting for you. Maybe we'll an association of Futerians say in the US because there's a lot. I mean, in Purdue, a lot currently. We are a lot. So, yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Let's I forget, <laughs> please, uh, could you send your slide to Scholar Abib? Uh, perhaps you can put your contacts. Oh, okay. Uh, email address well. Yeah, please. You can send it. Yeah, yeah I'll send it to our uh, on the drive. So. All right. No Scholar, problem. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you, sir. Uh, sorry, um, in case, um, so for those uh, questions, sorry. Say it again, sir. Hello, Scholar Uzin. Hello. I think we lost him. Uh, he's, not, uh, he's still here with us, but I think he's coming in. Okay, maybe we can just take a... Ask are you here, sir? I think he's not here. So we need to end this section now. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much everyone for attending our webinar on A to Z on how to secure a fully funded scholarship in the United States of America, July edition. Please follow us on uh, YouTube, follow us on LinkedIn, on, on Twitter. Please help us to subscribe to this channel. Please, we need your subscriber, please. So watch us for the next section of our Info international scholarship information section, which is going to come up around August. So please stay tuned. Thank you very much. And once again, Akim Mishalabi. So see you next time. Okay, thanks, uh, Prof. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah, Scholar was in. I think you were saying something the other time. Yeah, I don't know. It was already off. Um, uh, just for those questions that weren't answered, that anyone that still has some question can send it directly to the ISF platform. That okay. uh, the questions will be attended to there. Okay. 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 Yeah.
Mm-hmm. I think uh, once they are able to include their contact email address as well, but it will be better if they can post it on the group so that many people. Can yes, and also all the um, the presentation and the shared documents will be uploaded on the ISF drive. So for anyone that is um, in part of, part of the session, you can always go to the ISF drive and um, download everything yeah, for your useful. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Okay, thanks so much, Pro, for your time. I think I'm going to end the meeting now. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah.